In other videos in this series, we've seen how to define how to create a data window object, and here we have one that's been predefined. It is going to be displaying, for this demo's sake, uh, some employees from our test database. Now let's start talking about analogy. We want to begin exploring the concept of data window objects versus data window controls. So let's use an analogy to do that. If this data window object is a DVD, we need a DVD player to be able to make use of it, don't we? So where is this DVD player? Well, it's over here in this case for this demo on this window. And here is our window painter. And here is the data window control, our ostensible DVD player. Let me go ahead and put a DVD into the DVD player. So what I want to do is at design time to statically assign a default data window object to this data window control. So let's open up the properties grid and here's the data object property as it's so named and let's pick a data window object and in fact here it's going to be the employees too so here we've just placed that dvd in the dvd player and it is in fact this data window object <clears throat> we see uh, the uh, expression dark skin already kicking in even at design time so there we have it uh, the next step we need to take is to get data into this at runtime. And how do we provide for that? Well, we do that through the data window control. Let's go over to the Windows open script. <laughs> so here we have a transaction object SQLCA being initialized, and then that non-visual transaction object being used to connect to the database. And then what we need to do for the data window at runtime is to be able to associate the control with a database connection. And we do that through the set trans object function call. So here we have it. So this is the only binding, so to speak, that we need to perform uh, with the database, uh, binding it to the data window at runtime. Now, once this uh, database connection is associated with or bound to the data window control, the data window control can then delegate all the data requests to and from the data window object that it is hosting. And just a quick word at this point about database connections in Power Builder and their persistence, as well as transaction management. Uh, simply for clarity and brevity's sake, I am initializing the values of the transaction object SQLCA and the connecting to my database uh, using this particular transaction object. Uh, you and your team, certainly with Power Builder, uh, manage your atomic units of work as you will. Uh, they can persist as long or as short as you wish, as you deem as appropriate. But for this demo's sake, uh, I am simply having this database connection persist as long as an instance of this window persists. Uh, in fact, in the close event of the window, I am parenthetically disconnecting from the database. And in the open event, this is where I am choosing to show you associating this data window control with that database connection through the transaction object. And again, the data window control will pass uh, the requests back and forth from the data window object to the database using this transaction object. So we've already seen how to statically assign a data window object to a data window control at design time. But now let's examine how in Power Builder you can dynamically at runtime assign multiple data window objects to a single data window control. Let me go ahead and change solutions. So you'll see that in this simple UI, we have provided the user the capability of selecting from multiple data window presentation styles. Let's go ahead and look at the implementation. So yes, here we have in this choose case statement, a flow of control is allowing the user to select from multiple data window objects. And here we have their names specified as string values and being assigned to the data object property of the data window control. And an interesting fact about Power Builder, you'll recall that the database connection is associated directly with the data window object through the transaction object through the data window control. So if you do change the data window object, you'll need to reestablish the association between that data window object and the database connection via the transaction object, the data window control for that reassociation with the set trans object call. Now the observant among you will notice that there is value of 300 being submitted to the retrieve call for the data window control as an argument, as a parameter, and that means that the data window object itself has uh, had defined for it 
a retrieval argument. In fact, data window objects may have multiple retrieval arguments specified for it. They will act as host variables. So let's go ahead and open up that data window object D product entry 115 and see how it's done. So we will go into the design menu item and select data source and return to where we graphically painted the select statement for this particular data window object. And we see here in the syntax a preview of the WHERE clause. Uh, if you look closely, you will see that there has actually been a host variable defined. In fact, in data window speak, uh, this is a retrieval argument. We'll go up to design, retrieval arguments, and we see here that we have the opportunity to add multiple data window object retrieval arguments, if we wish, of various data types. And once the retrieval argument is defined, we can go to the WHERE clause tab page and define which column is going to be a member of this WHERE clause, as well as which retrieval argument we want to select to assign to that particular column. And notice the prefixed colon. And returning to the window painter and the script painter within it, we see the list of what could potentially be multiple comma-separated values that are submitted as retrieval arguments to the data window object at runtime. And further along the lines of the data intelligence of the data window object, let's go ahead and look at its update properties. So here in the data window painter, let's drop down the rows menu item and choose update properties. And we see right off the bat that if we wish, this data window object could be made to be read-only. By unchecking this allow updates checkbox, you could prevent any modifications being submitted to the relational source, the store procedure calls, or the web service calls that are its data source. Here in this drop-down list box, we would see the potentially multiple tables that are part of the select statements join. Uh, by default, the data window object will update only one table in its select statement, certainly through code, like in the Power Foundation class's multi-table service. Uh, you can dynamically change that at runtime to be able to update any or all of the tables that are part of this join. We also have the ability to choose which flavor of key modification to pursue. Uh, we could use delete then insert statements or simply use a bald-faced update. And here is the updatable columns list. You could further constrain the result set to have only a subset of its columns be updatable. And here's your chance to define the unique key columns for this particular data window object. It should probably reflect the primary key of the table. And then a chance to designate the identity column. Let's say that you had an ID column uh, that was defined as auto-incremented. You could flag that here as well. And here is your opportunity to designate to what degree you wish to pursue optimistic concurrency. In that, the data window at runtime will create uh, the update and delete statements from scratch for you by tracking the users and your scripted modifications. You can designate whether it's just the key columns that will be part of the WHERE clause defining the original row to be updated, uh, whether it's going to be the key and just the modified columns, or indeed the key and all the updatable columns. Now this code example will allow us to illustrate how you may pursue optimistic concurrency with the data window at runtime, as well as a further demonstration of the data intelligence of the data window. Let's go ahead and look at the clicked event of this command button, and we see that there is a single update call to the data window control itself. Uh, we are reminded that in other videos in the series, we've seen how the data window keeps track of all the users and your scripted modifications to the data. It then will, when this update call is made, 
create all the inserts, updates, and deletes that are necessary from scratch. And let's return to the layout view of the Window Painter, and we see that I have given the user the ability to choose to what degree they wish to pursue Optimist Concurrency by offering them the same three options for the where clause uh, that were in the Data Window Painter. So let's return to the Script Painter, and we see that before the update call, I am calling this developer defined method, OF concurrency mod. And if we go to its implementation, we see that there is logic to determine which option the user has selected, and it is then concatenated to the string that is designated for that particular property of the data window. It is named data window .table .update where. Uh, once we have that modification string, we utilize it in a modify call to the data window control, which is then passed on to the data window object. More on the modify call and the way it can dynamically not just modify, but also create data window objects at runtime in another video. In order to further illustrate the data window's data intelligence at runtime, I've added a bit of a script to a data window control event called SQL Preview or SQL Preview. Now what I've done with a SQL Preview event in order to illustrate the data intelligence of the data window is probably something you should never do in your production applications. And that is to be able to use a message box to see what the data window is about to submit to your relational source. In fact, here we see the arguments uh, that are part of this event. A request, uh, the function, uh, the SQL type, the actual syntax of the SQL call, as well as which data window buffer uh, is being manipulated, as well as which row in that buffer is being manipulated. And simply what I want you folks at this juncture to see is uh, the flavor of where clause implemented optimistic concurrency is actually being issued to the database. Now the original intent behind having this SQL preview event, as can be seen in this help file entry, is that you might want to, before this uh, information is sent to the database, in fact, this uh, modification request uh, is made, that you have your opportunity to A, insert your own logic, and then B, prevent the data window from submitting this SQL statement to the database in case your particular logic was meant to supplant that of the data window. So here what I'm doing is simply providing you a window into what the data window is about to submit to the database at runtime. So by displaying this message box calls results at runtime, I'm simply giving you a window into the data window's data intelligence and what it is doing backstage, so to speak, as far as interactivity with the database. Okay, here is my code sample at runtime. Let me go ahead and retrieve some data into the primary buffer, and we see that the SQL preview event logic is already kicking in. In fact, the data window is about to submit a select statement to the database uh, through the data window control through the transaction object that's maintaining that database connection. So here we see the syntax of the SQL statement containing uh, the columns in question and the table in question. Uh, the SQL preview request is the preview function retrieve. The SQL type is preview select, the buffer being manipulated is the primary buffer, and because there are no rows yet in the result set, the row number is zero. Let me go ahead and click OK. And now let's simply give the data window some work to perform. Uh, what I want to do is to insert a new row, and but just between you and me, I've hard-coded some values here. Let's go ahead and modify And let's go ahead and choose a row to delete. And now what I want to do is to issue that single line of code for update. Uh, but if you'll recall, before the update is issued, that function call is being made to modify the where clause concurrency flavor. So here we see the delete for the row that I've deleted from the primary buffer. The data window is now going to utilize its data intelligence to persist that deletion from the buffer to the database. So we see the preview function update, preview delete for the SQL type, and the buffer is delete. In fact, uh, the row in the primary buffer was moved from the primary buffer to the delete buffer. And in this case, this is row one of the delete buffer. I'll click OK. And there's also an insert being made with these values. And we see 
update, preview insert, primary in row one. And we see update. And in this case, the update contains uh, the key and all updatable columns. We'll click OK. So let's say that this time I wish to select a different level of optimistic concurrency. I'm going to change Sheila's last name to Smith and choose key and just the modified columns, not all the updatable columns as part of the WHERE clause. So let's go ahead and issue the update. And we see that in fact, yes, it is just the key columns and the column, in this case, last name, that was modified. And let's go even further for just key columns being part of that WHERE clause. Let's change Anthony's department to sales and issue the update. And we see, in fact, that only the ID column, the unique identifier, is part of the WHERE clause. So I hope this session of our data window primer has given you a good window into the data window's data intelligence.